Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for UBC Read Sustainability with Jeff Dembicki, moderated by Dr. Carol Liao. My name is Tara Ivanochko, and I'm the Academic Director of the UBC Sustainability Hub and faculty in the Department of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences. I am joining this session from the unceded traditional and ancestral territories of the Musqueam Nation. In Jeff's excellent book, which we will delve into soon, um, he discusses disinformation campaigns and crisis denial underwritten by oil companies. This made me consider how expanded oil production and land degradation driven by the denial of climate change have impacted indigenous land use and sovereignty. Oil companies have been able to deny climate change science while creating an environmental catastrophe on indigenous lands in Alberta. Many lawsuits and challenges to the tar sands have been led um, by indigenous nations in Alberta and elsewhere, including here in BC. If the indig indigenous nations in Canada had sovereign rights over their traditional territories and free prior and informed consent was upheld to the highest standards, I expect that the presentation that we're hearing today would be radically different. I'll be giving you a quick introduction to the session and then passing it over to Dr. Carol Liao, who will lead a moderated conversation with Jeff Dambicki and present some questions from you, the audience. The chat box will be disabled for the event, so please post your questions in the question box. You can also use the question box to let us know if you're having any technical difficulties and one of our team will be um, there to assist you. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carol Liao and Jeff Dembicki. Dr. Carol Liao is an associate professor and director of the Center of Business Law at UBC Allard School of Law. She is also the UBC Sauter Distinguished Scholar at the Dillon Center for Business Ethics and the UBC Sauter School of Business and a principal co-investigator of the Canada Climate Law Initiative. Her research focuses on corporate law and sustainability, climate governance, gender, and racial justice. She is the recipient of the 2021 Influential Women of Business Award from Business in Vancouver and the 2022 Woman of the Year Award from the BC Business Magazine. She was also named one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women by the Women's Executive Network. She is the editor of two newly launched books, Corporate Law and Sustainability from the Next Generation of Lawyers and Innovating Business for Sustainability, Regulatory Approaches in the Anthropocene. Both titles are relevant to today's discussion with Jeff Dambicki about his new book, The Petroleum Papers, Inside the Far-Right Conspiracy to Cover Up Climate Change. Jeff Dambicki is an investigative climate change journalist from Alberta, the home of the largest tar, uh, tar sound deposits in, in the world. He is a frequent contributor to The Guardian, Vice, and The Taiyi, and his work has been featured in NPR and The New York Times, as well as CBC. His book, The Petroleum Papers, is a finalist for the 2022 Hillary Weston Writers Trust Prize for Nonfiction and has been called an essential read by The Washington Post. The Petroleum Papers is available at the UBC Bookstore in person and online with a special 20% discount uh, this month to celebrate Jeff being with, here with us today. Jeff's previous book, Are We Screwed? How a New Generation is Fighting to Survive Climate Change, won the 2017 Dave Grieber Freelance Writers Award and the 2018 Green Prize for Sustainable Literature. His magazine feature for foreign policy titled The Convenient Disappearance of Climate Change Denial in China, won the 2018 Energy of Words Media Contest. Jeff lives in Brooklyn, New York, and he's joining us from there today. So UBC has declared a climate emergency and has an ambitious ta task force report, which aims to embed climate justice in all of UBC's educational, operational, and community partnership activities. One key priority is more climate education, and today's UBC Reads Sustainability event is an example of more climate education. We're pleased that you can join us. We know that you'll enjoy the discussions between these authors, and we would like to thank them for being with us today. Dr. Liao, I now pass it over to you. 
Thank you so much, uh, Tara. I'm so happy to be here. So, um, Jeff, uh, you know, I am so thrilled to be moderating this, and uh, I really want to congratulate him uh, and on your, you know, Jeff, on your phenomenal, uh, engaging book. It's a real thoughtful, informative read uh, that clearly evidences such a deep level of knowledge and research, and I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, congratulations on the well-deserved Hillary Weston Award nomination and all the successes of the book to date. Um, I'll also just say before we start, you know, sometimes it can really feel like we just live in a world of spin, a, a post-truth era, and I just want to say right off the bat how important uh, I think independent investigative journalists like you are in this day and age, so thank you. Um, and so I'm just thrilled to be here with you to talk about your book. I feel spoiled to be the one with the opportunity. So uh, thanks. Um, so let's let's start. I'll just uh, begin by saying what I loved about your book is it's very Canadian content and the chronology of events in which you take us quite succinctly through Big Oil's campaign of uh, disinformation and how Imperial Oil, as Exxon was known then as far back as the late 80s, um, recognized there was a growing corporate risk of this public understanding that the petroleum industry was a major contributor to pollution, etc. Why did you uh, start there and how did you know to begin there? Well, I started getting, I been. I mean, I've been interested in like climate disinformation for a really long time. And it's like kind of one of the reasons that I, I got into this type of investigative research. I, I just hate being lied to and bullshitted. <laughs> and as I'm, I'm sure most of us do, um, especially by by people in power who, who sort of know know what they're doing. And uh, a few years ago, there was some really incredible reporting by the Los Angeles Times and this other site inside climate news that was all about um, how Exxon had studied climate change internally, spent all this money on research and had, had essentially become some of the world's like leading climate experts, like well before the public knew anything about this emergency. And then Exxon had um, intentionally spun that research and led campaigns to try to convince the public that climate change isn't real. And my mind was just absolutely blown reading these stories, um, many of them were focused on the, the US. And, and I thought, well, you know, Exxon has been involved um, in, in the oil sands basically since, since it got going. Um, and so I, I figured there, there had to be this whole Canadian angle to this mm -hmm. disinformation story. And so I knew that, you know, a lot of American reporters weren't looking into this and few people in Canada were paying attention. And so as, as someone who was from Alberta, but, but living in the US, I, I thought I was in a, a good position to start looking at the Canadian angle and how that in turn really influenced the spread of disinformation in the United States. So that's how I got started down this path. You know, yeah, and I love that because also I think for many of us, we have this image of Canadian exceptionalism, like that we are kind of better <laughs> in some ways, you know, that we have a social welfare state, you know, safety net, we have all these uh, gun control, you know, and healthcare, but, you know, we forget this big picture and also how we're such a natural resource economy um, and how we can be implicated in so many of these things. And, you know, you, you quote, um, Eric Pooley from his book, The Climate War, where he says, uh, um, let me find that, the notion that fixing the climate necessarily means destroying the economy was to become the big lie of the climate debate and the signature achievement of the opponents of action. And you noted, uh, Jeff, how there's evidence that this lie partially originated in Canada. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I think this lie originated to a large degree in Canada. And my source for that is this 1993 document that I read through that was probably one of the most just like astounding and infuriating things that I came across in my research for this book. So I, I read I read hundreds and hundreds of documents about climate change produced 
by the oil and gas industry. Many of them were labeled confidential. These weren't intended to be seen mm. by the public. But this, this one document in particular really jumped out at me. And it was produced by Imperial Oil, which is essentially Exxon's Canadian arm. And so it was the early 90s. Imperial had studied climate change for quite a long time. They knew the causes of it. They knew it was caused by burning oil and gas. And in the early 90s, Imperial decided to go one step further and research potentially how do we fix this climate emergency. And th this is like really early days, like people are barely even talking about climate change in public. And Imper Imperial is doing this like sophisticated economic um, analyses on climate solutions. And it, it determines back in the early 90s, if there was a national price on carbon emissions across Canada, this could result in, quote, approximate stabilization of emissions. Like we, we would stop increasing the rate that we release greenhouse gases, which is, it, it is huge. We would get a handle on this emergency. Um, and Imperial even calculated that this, this wouldn't have a major impact on the economy. There would be a bit of a hit at first as some of the polluting, most polluting industries closed down. But that, that would be offset because governments would have all of this revenue from taxing carbon and they could use it to fund a massive green stimulus. And this, this would be really good for the economy. However, Imperial determined that such a climate solution would be really bad for its profits in the oil sands. Um, it would hit the company, um, they estimated about $900 million. And so in this document I've, I'm, I'm referring to, Imperial created a list of talking points. They also shared it with um, Exxon. And these were things that people at the company should say to media and to government to make climate solutions look economically reckless, cast doubt about whether they were even good for the environment. And these talking points directly contradicted what the company was finding internally. And this is just so mind blowing to me because I was like, wow, this huge oil and gas company yeah. figured out how to solve this crisis decades ago and then made sure that that never happened. Yeah, it was actually, it really got to me too, just thinking about, you know, um, this clear message of how the oil companies had studied this climate change issue for internally for decades ahead of the government and knew that information maybe could have helped us mitigate that. And you, you bring an example, you recounted this incredible example too of how we managed to combat the risk of acid rain. You know, and you, you, you use that too, you talk, talk about the cap and trade framework actually managed to prevent acid rain under the George H.W. Bush administration, a Republican administration. And, and that was almost painful to know uh, because it did show the opportunity uh, that could have had it, you know, that we could have had there. And, you know, what could have been had that the fossil fuel company disinformation never been spread, you know, and what solutions uh, could have been possible. And so, you know, I, I'm curious to do you then, is it fair for us to presume then that had the oil companies acted upon the research they collected, you know, in an ethical and different way that we wouldn't be in the place we're in now? I mean, that's certainly what my research led me to believe. Um, when, when James Hansen first testified to Congress about climate change back in 1988 and put it on the public's radar for the first time, there was a lot of political momentum behind solutions. And, and in fact, like it's it's really hard to believe now, but it that that was a period when people, leaders across the political spectrum saw addressing climate change as something that just made a lot of economic sense. So you mentioned mm -hmm. acid rain, that was under a Republican administration, and that was estimated to have created like hundreds of billions of dollars in like positive impacts. To the U.S. economy. Um, the Mulroney government in Canada also led the way on a lot of really interesting environmental initiatives. And in the early 90s, the Mulroney government was um, proposing this sort of like massive green restructuring of the Canadian economy. And there were, 
countries all over the world saying like, you know, if we act now on climate change, we could get this under control and it will be, it will be good for the economy. And I, I think the, the main lasting impact of the disinformation campaigns that I, um, that I cover in the book is, is to destroy that partisan consensus and to polarize the issue, um, to turn it into this thing that, you know, only the eco-radicals want to do and it's it's going to take away your job and tank the economy and and that that was all deliberately planned it was part of a strategy it's contained in documents i looked at and we're really living with the legacy of that now yeah yeah and so you know a fact that was provided in one of the lawsuits that you mentioned in the book was how um in 1992, like 88% or, you know, very high number of Americans believed that global warming was a serious problem. But actually, in 1997, five years later, that number had fallen to 42%, with like only a quarter thinking immediate action was needed. And I was just, you know, and, and I think there were similar stats that you provided too in Canada. And I'm, I thought maybe it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on the role of Canadian politics. And you talked, you did sort of talk about the Harper years, and I'd love you to take us through that and how devastating um, his leadership was to combating climate change here in Canada. You know, like the, it was to me a bit phenomenal. And was that the chapter that you said you needed the FOI <laughs> to get that, that information? That that was part of it, yeah. And I, I mean, I started writing about climate change during the Harper years. So I, I feel like that that sort of like set my baseline. I was like, oh, this is just normal that the federal government like won't allow climate scientists to speak to the media. And it was it was when I was doing this book with the 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 benefit of a sort of like a few years um, distance and all those events, looking back at the Harper years, I was like, oh my God, like this, this was like a really like reactionary time period. And especially in, in the earlier years, um, the strategy that the Harper government took towards climate change was very similar that leading Canadian oil sands producers took to climate change. <laughs> and so to just give you an example, um, Imperial Oil, one of the, the big oil sands producers, in Canada, they had studied climate change internally for decades. They had studied solutions to it. And then they buried that research and intentionally spread um, disinformation about whether climate change was even happening and how addressing it would be horrible for the economy. And, you know, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that earlier in his career, Harper actually worked for Imperial Oil. And he, he brought many of these same industry tactics to how the government in Canada operated. So the Canadian government, um, you know, its scientists have been producing world leading research about the climate emergency. And under Harper, he, he made sure that, that those reports were, were buried or um, the media was unable to access them. Um, and then at the same time, Harper recruited from a network of pretty far right wing think tanks in Canada, including the Fraser Institute, and, and put climate change deniers in key positions in the federal government. And I, I, was, I was just astounded at the way this mimicked the disinformation campaigns of, of oil and gas producers in the country. Mm -hmm. And then I, I can get into a bit more of this later, but at the same time, the Harper government worked with the Alberta government and key oil producers on both sides of the border to intentionally attack and sabotage major climate legislation that the US government under Obama was proposing. Yeah, that's incredible. You know, just, just to pick up on, I'm just curious, how did you get access to all those documents? I'm thinking about all those internal documents that were in, you know, referenced in the book, like the private letters to the prime ministers, you know, the research, uh, the emails, you know, the, these exposés, how did you, how did you get them? Well, one of the, one of the kind of amazing things that I've found doing this type of work is, is that all of, all of the information about the truth 
of the climate emergency and like the extent to which we've been lied to by industry, it's it's all publicly available. You just have to know where to look for it. And so I, I, I had been in touch with a lot of disinformation experts on both sides of the border, but it, especially in the US where this stuff is like really tracked pretty carefully. And there were groups such as um, DSmog and Climate Investigation Center mm -hmm. They, they did the hard work of actually finding all these documents, going to the archives, photocopying them, scanning it online, annotating the documents. And then they threw this stuff up in sort of like vast digital archives. And the, the average person is, is not gonna go on one of these websites and figure out how to navigate it and, um, and read through the documents. But I, I, I found one site that essentially listed all the major known internal oil industry documents about climate change by year going back to the 1950s. And there are like hundreds and hundreds of them. And I thought, okay, I'm, I'm gonna read every single one. <laughs> and so that's, We're glad you did, that's not what us. <laughs> I did. And I learned a ton of interesting stuff doing that. No doubt. Yeah, no, we're all, we are all very grateful you did all that work because I don't see uh, the large majority of us parsing through the amount of material that you certainly did and have now placed in this wonderful book all together and tightly for us, um, which which is just great. Um, you know, there are some recurrent characters in the book that you point to that to me seem to have these dual personas, right? Like I'm thinking of Robert Peterson, the chairman and CEO of Imperial Oil, how he presented himself at work versus his family. And I feel this dual personality seems to come up across a number of these characters, um, Rupert Murdoch, um, BP. Uh, it was interesting in terms of their corporate duality. It's interesting, they were interesting in their positioning, we withdrew from the Global Climate Coalition, uh, which by the way, if you heard that and didn't know what it was about, that sounds good, Global Con Climate Co Coalition. <laughs> Maybe you can talk more about uh, what that uh, group was. And, and that resulted actually with, with them withdrawing a, tons of positive publicity, you say. But, you know, what did that mean in terms of their action otherwise? And so I'm just curious sort of what your, if you had noticed that and what your thinking is on that. Well, I think with, with every major influential public player on climate change, there's there's what there's what they say in public. There's like their their public persona, and and then there's sort of like what they actually know and believe behind the scenes. And with with climate change, that divide is like pretty drastic, as I found. And so I I, I was really trying to go behind a lot of the public statements with this book that like politicians and executives were making. And, and to show the true like strategy and like power calculus that was going on behind the scenes. So for example, um, you know, Robert Peterson, he was the chairman of Imperial Oil in the 90s. So this, this was like a, a crucial moment when the company could have shared mm -hmm. its internal research on the climate emergency. It could have shared all the work that it had done on, yeah. on climate solutions and you know, portrayed those accurately to government and media. Um, but, but instead, starting in the mid to late 90s, you know, Robert Peterson in, in the company's shareholder reports, um, he, he would write these long letters saying, you know, the, the science is unfounded about climate change. We, we don't actually know if this is real. We can't, we can't prove for certain whether fossil fuels are part of the problem. And it was just like such, such a blatant like yeah. discrepancy between, um, you know, what, what the company was actually discovering privately. Um, but, you know, pe people didn't know that at the time. And Robert Peterson, he, you know, he was, he's honored within the industry as part of the Canadian Petroleum um, like Hall of Fame. Um, there were glowing articles written about him, and you know it's 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 the same thing with a lot of these other players, and it continues to be this way. Like there's there's something said in public, and then the true story is mm -hmm. always what's happening mm -hmm. behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know um, one character also that I found interesting was Frank Lutz Luntz, 
Did he bring him? He was the uh, a publicist. Did he, he did publicity or something? And he and also how um, he seemed to flip flip back and forth, right? Like and and how uh, undermine in terms of undermining and then supporting the climate science and how there had been this discussion on how far-reaching climate legislation could have been hugely popular even among the deniers of the scientific consensus if it were framed in a particular way, such as reducing U.S. dependence on Middle Eastern oil and preventing the country from losing out on clean energy jobs to China. You know, it, it's just sort of seeing the, the flip and yet it seems like we lost the story. Um, I, I just find it kind of, it's depressing in a way. Um, and I actually, in that persona, what about Trudeau? You, we mentioned, you mentioned him just briefly too, to outsiders who didn't pay much attention to Canada uh, and still maybe don't. We might have seemed as though we're actually taking climate change quite seriously right now. Do you think I mean, that's- Tr Trudeau is, you know, is a really interesting person to, to look at in the context of this story because outside of Canada, people are like, wow, yeah, Trudeau. I mean, I'm, I'm living in, in Brooklyn and, and people I meet who, you know, have, have a very like clear understanding of, of the climate emergency. When, when they look up at Canada, they're like, oh, wow, well, things aren't as screwed up yeah. um, in Canada as they are down here. And I'm like, well, we just, we just put like a kind of like a shinier, nicer face on things. But a, lo a lot of the underlying like power structure is, is still there and and to me like the most the most damning thing that that I that I found through my research this is actually reported in the guardian a few years ago but I I didn't see it at the time um, was how when Trump was elected president you know publicly Trudeau was was tweeting and saying um, you know we respect human rights we will welcome immigrants into this country and he got like just a ton of like positive publicity for that behind the scenes, the Canadian government was, was actually thrilled that Trump came to power. And um, there, were, there were memos written um, at high levels of the government saying how this would be great for the oil sands industry. And it was, it was awesome to have you know, an ally of Canadian oil in the White House. And I was like, oh my God, this is just so cynical. Yeah, yeah it is so cynical. I just, it's just, painful, I'd say, in a way, <laughs> like the, to sort of, um, I guess, wrap your head around um, what occurred and what is occurring. And, you know, another thread I found in the book uh, was that of whistleblowers. Um, you know, I'm thinking of Jeffrey Wigan at Brown and Williamson, which was the, because you referenced the tobacco litigation um, as kind of sort of a, an example for how potentially this litigation uh, against the oil industry may um, reach uh, fruition and how Jeffrey Wigan um, discovered the cigarette additive in their products that caused tumors in mice and then he was promptly fired and the, and private investigators were hired to find dirt on him. And I'm thinking about um, Enrique Rosero, who you brought up in the book, this young engineer from Exxon. And uh, my question is, what happens to these? I don't even know if he was a whistleblower so much as just someone that expressed dissent in the organization, <laughs> you know. But what happens to these whistleblowers in the end? You know, is there no protection, no satisfaction for them, no accountability? You know, how important are these whistleblowers, and what can we do, can we do to protect, better protect them? And in a way, are you a whistleblower? Because you know, we're, there's a question actually um, that was posed on what kind of resistance or support did you encounter trying to access information um, that informed your writing? Um, so, you know, if you could chat about where, what role they played in your reporting and how important they are, and if we can do better, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Well, Enrique Rosero was one of the more interesting interviews that I've I've ever had in in my reporting because he worked at Exxon for um, almost a decade, and he he was like by all accounts like highly trusted within the company and and worked on huge projects. 
for them. So he was hired right out of university. Um, he, he actually worked on, on some of the, the oil sand stuff um, with Imperial. And he was, he was part of a, a, a plan that, that helped um, um, that help move the company's strategy of, of tapping all of these barrels of oil off the Guyana coast in, in South America. So Enrique was like, yeah, I was, I was in it. I was fully in it. I worked on, on the big projects. I was very valuable to the company. And, and Enrique kind of like, you know, he, 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 he sort of supported Exxon's messaging about what it was doing. He never, he never felt like, um, you know, his, his work was really like immoral or, or unethical. And, and he thought the people that attacked the company from the outside, you know, maybe they were well-intentioned, but they, they, did, they didn't really truly see Exxon the way he did, which was a collection of like smart, um, compassionate people all trying to solve the world's big energy challenges. And so that changed for Enrique when he started reading this reporting that I was referring to a few years ago um, about Exxon's secret research into climate change and the way it had spun that and worked on denial campaigns. And Enrique was like, oh my God, like what? Like I'm I'm in the I'm in the business of science. Like I I don't believe in a, a company like lying about the science it produces. Like what the fuck? Um, and so Enrique was getting like deeper and deeper into this. He was reading everything he could. He was having conversations with people at work about it. And I was like, how did those conversations go? And he's like, oh, not that well. And, <laughs> and then there was an opportunity for employees at the company to gather at this town hall event um, in early 2020 and ask questions of executives at the company. And so Enrique very bravely, I thought, got up in front of the room and he said, you know, I've, I've heard all of this research about how um, Exxon spread climate change denial. And I'm, I'm just wondering like what we as a company are gonna do to atone for that. And there was sort of like polite reaction in the room and they, they just moved on. He was like, okay, they just don't wanna answer my question. Um, afterwards, he got called in for a performance review and he learned that his internal rating at the company had been downgraded to the lowest yeah. possible level. Essentially, he was placed on corporate probation. He could be fired at any time. And then he, he willingly left the company and he decided he wanted to go to work for a company that's actually um, trying to fix the climate emergency. And so I, I spoke with Exxon about this and they were like, oh no, we absolutely do not retaliate against um, whistleblowers or, um, and that, that's just not our corporate policy. But I, I went on a bunch of Exxon message boards and it seemed to be the opinion of a lot of his coworkers that this was the reason he was pushed out of the company. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so from that, is that just it then? Like that's that's it in terms of people who speak out. Like and and so it does play in then to my next question. We're getting all these great questions coming in uh, in the Q and A. So you know, one I'll say, uh, one question is they're curious to understand more about Imperial Oil's research in the '90s uh, and who conducted their research. You know, because we talk about it being internal. And how widespread did those findings ever get? You know, was it ever released beyond the executive? And um, so maybe answer that first. And then I want to talk to you about what we, how do we then combat the disinformation uh, that, that came out uh, after as a result of that? So, so first, yeah, talking about this, who conducted their research, you know, and how widespread did it go? Um, I can't remember the exact name of the consultancy but they they hired an outside group to do um a, um, a bunch of different like ec economic modeling around various climate solutions and interestingly one of the solutions they studied was carbon capture and storage and they they determined back in the 90s that this solution um, was, you know, technically feasible, but extremely uneconomic and unlikely to ever be deployed um, at large scale. And, and now like carbon capture and storage, like is the climate plan for the oil sands industry all these years later. And 
people I've spoken with said, you know, the fundamentals of that haven't really changed since Imperial Oil looked at it in the 90s. But um, this, this research, um, it was... It was disseminated to um, to some to some government policymakers, um, but it, it was it was sort of all made public through the spin of Imperial, and and they had they had a very clear um, message they wanted to put on this research, which is contained in those those talking points that I was looking at, and and the the spin was you know Canada's economy is very precarious. Um, fixing climate change will cause all of this economic damage and, and disruption. And we can't even know for sure if, if this will be good for the environment. So that, that, that was the spin that was all on all of this. And I think because Imperial was so early to studying climate solutions and doing this type of research that really allowed them to set the terms of the debate. Right. Um, and, and so the same consultancy that Imperial used for this study, um, they, that, that same group was later used a few years later in the United States by the Global Climate Coalition, which was the preeminent climate denier group of the 90s. Like they ran ads in the New York Times saying um, climate science isn't, isn't real. Um, climate action will destroy the economy. And, and so I, I thought that was kind of interesting. It's like Imperial Oil looks at this stuff in Canada from a Canadian context, develops these talking points, and then they're sort of exported to the US and scaled up to this huge and much more consequential level. I mean, and just to give you an example of the power of this climate coalition group, when George W. Bush pulled out of um, Kyoto, or they, the U.S. never really signed on, but um, you know the the U.S. government um, created this memo crediting the Global Climate Coalition with um, stopping the U.S. government from from being a part of that climate treaty. So these, this is a, a very powerful group. Yeah, no, it's enraging actually uh, hearing about this and and reading it in the book. It was just you get a swarm of emotions in a way on the denial apparatus that's in place and how we've lost decades because of the spin and you know and those impacts being felt now. I mean, it's just a question that uh, we got in the chat too, which is thematic of some that are really popping up here. Are you know how can we combat that disinformation? Do you have any ideas? Because it just seems so overwhelming, right? Like, and so there's two aspects to it right now in terms of just the disinformation generally and how it polarized what was, what was at one point a very generally bipartisan consensus agreement that we needed to address these issues. So how do you think we, maybe individually, but also institutionally combat that disinformation. And then the second is how do we hold big oil accountable going forward? And that maybe then we get to talk about Steve Berman and all these. So, so first, how can we combat it? Well, I, I think, I think the first thing that really needs to happen is we need to like fundamentally change the story that we've been telling about climate change, because like the traditional narrative is that, you know, this, this is like the result of some like innate flaw in us as humans, like, um, we're, we're all sort of like these, these greedy, competitive individuals, we just drive our SUVs and spew pollution into the atmosphere, we heat our homes with fossil fuels. And so we're, we're all like individually, like equally guilty for this vast, like systemic crisis. And that, that, that thinking is like very, very widely held and you, and you still see it all the time. Um, and, and the, the big takeaway I had from doing this book was that that that's not really like an accurate story for why we're in this climate emergency, because there were so many moments over the years when everything was in place to, to get the sort of wide scale solutions we needed. There were, there were multiple times. Um, and, and the main people blocking that from happening were the executives of, of large oil and gas companies. I mean, they, 
their, their strategy documents are publicly available. I've, I've read them. Um, they've, they've bragged about their efforts to sabotage climate action. And I, I think to a large degree, the emergency that we're in now was, was caused by the actions of a relatively small group of, of companies and, and the people who run them. So that, that's a much different climate story than what we've been told. And I, I, I don't think the reality of this situation has really sunk in for most people yet. However, when, when people learn the truth about the extent to which they've been lied to, um, it, it enrages them and it, it makes them want to take action. So there's been like really fascinating polling being done on this um, in the United States. Um, even, even among Republicans who, who are hesitant to say that climate change is even real, like when, when they learn how much they've been lied to by oil companies, there are big jumps in the number of people who, who want to do something about that, who want to hold these companies accountable. And the, the oil industry, I think, is really terrified of, of this narrative becoming more widespread. And so I think, you know, once more people are, are aware of this and, and want to take concrete action, um, you know, they, they, they should look to any type of, of social movement or, or larger group that, that is working in this space. There's, there's not a ton of in Canada at the moment, but I know like West Coast Environmental Law is, is doing some really interesting research around climate accountability. Um, basically, we, we have to get out of this idea that we're, we can only make a difference as like individuals or consumers. I think the moment you join a group or a social movement, like your, your individual impact is just multiplied um, by so many orders of magnitude. And, and so, I, I mean, I, I think that's a good segue into talking about what people are doing in the U.S. and some of the conversations in Canada that are happening around climate liability. Yeah, let's talk about that. Is there any hope for holding big oil accountable? You know, do you think, uh, and, and let's talk about, you know, uh, the things in the book that you mentioned, including this Steve Berman, the lawyer in the story, you know, and... Uh, he had an interesting quote uh, that I wanted to get your reflection on. He said, the way to make change is to get trained in what the establishment does and make change through the process. Um, I am curious, and you know, I loved, I loved what you said about, you know, it's a movement and it's, 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 it's a collective action movement, right? Um, but I am curious as to where the law is in play. It seemed actually in reading the book how, you reflect on how you would think democratically elected governments would be effective, you know, in addressing these issues, but it seems like, you know, and, and you bring up Harper and you bring up Trump and how he appointed Rex Tillerson, Tillerson, um, Tillerson from, uh, as his secretary of state. Um, and, you know, it, it seems that maybe it's the courts where we'll be able to see something. What do you think about that? Tell us about Steve and what's going on in that um, instance. Is there any hope that we're going to hold them accountable? I mean, I guess I guess we'll see, won't we? But so Steve Steve Berman, he was someone I interviewed for the book, and he's a quite well known class action lawyer um, based in Seattle. And Steve Berman became quite famous in the '90s for working on. Um, litigation against the tobacco industry for lying about whether their products cause cancer. And so when Steve Berman um, got initially involved in those lawsuits, um, you know, a lot of people at his firm were very worried. No one had ever won a lawsuit against the tobacco industry before. They were like seen as extremely intimidating, had huge teams of lawyers. Um, but then, you know, Steve Berman and, and other people in in the U.S. were successful in, in bringing litigation against big tobacco that resulted in one of the biggest corporate settlements in history, and they were forced to acknowledge the lies they had told um, about cancer, and it, it really dealt like a huge blow to the industry, and so after all that happened, Steve was like looking around for like kind of what his next big like career-making um, litigation could be, and he he was he got really interested in 
in climate change in the oil and gas industry. And he was like, oh my God, like the way that oil and gas has lied about climate change is like almost identical to the way that big tobacco lied about cancer. And then he started looking even deeper into it. And he was like, wait a second, it's the same lawyers. It's the same trade organizations. It's like the same front groups that were involved in the tobacco stuff. And now they're working for oil and gas. I'm like, like literally, um, there are organizations like the National Association of Manufacturers. At one point, they were running disinformation campaigns for tobacco and oil at the same time. And so um, in 2017, Steve Berman helped represent the cities of San Francisco and Oakland um, in launching lawsuits against the oil and gas industry for lying to the public about climate change and asking for damages that could cover the billions and billions of dollars that those cities would have to spend on new seawalls as a result of sea level rise. And so that, that legal movement has really taken off in the mm. last few years. And there are now more than 20 jurisdictions across the US, including um, New York City. Um, there's, there's lawsuits in, in Colorado, New Jersey just filed one. And it's, you know, it's, it's a big deal. There are powerful players working on this stuff. And we, we haven't quite seen that take off in, in Canada quite yet. Um, and I mean, yeah. there, there are a lot of reasons for that, but I, I can say that this, this movement is like very, very well developed in the United States and has a lot of momentum behind it. I don't know where it will end up yet, but the oil and gas industry is, is definitely like very worried about this. Yeah, yeah, no, the litigation is certainly heating up. It has arrived in Canada. We've seen governments, municipalities, corporations trying to be held accountable. And it just seems as though um, the plaintiffs are actually getting quite creative in terms of the legal tools that they're willing to use, right? Like all the way down to just plain vanilla tort liability. There's the fraud that you mentioned. And then now, uh, as you said, state in the book, this causation element is actually getting to be um, uh far far more um filled out than it was a couple decades ago in terms of proving uh these large emitters are contributing to climate change and you know the supreme court of canada has taken judicial notice that climate change is real so now a court a litigant doesn't have to go in and prove that it exists it's already just taken as a given so there are have been some movements but certainly you know it's more like watch this space right mm -hmm. um and so I want to take it uh, a little bit um, in a different angle here, too. I want to talk about how in your book, you know, you beautifully weave in the story of the uh, Sustento family and Joanna Sustento in particular. Um, can you tell us more about her and how, how did you come uh, across her and why did how, why was she important to include in in the book? So a few years ago, I went to the Philippines where the um, National Human Rights Commission there was about to launch a big investigation into the oil and gas industry. And, and I, I thought this was like, you know, pretty unique. I hadn't heard about anything like this. And I, I, wanted, I wanted to be there on the ground, especially because um, there were Canadian companies named in that investigation, including Suncor, the major oil and gas producer in Canada. And essentially the, the Human Rights Commission there um, was, was looking into the question of, of whether major oil and gas companies um, should be held liable for human rights violations because of the massive emissions from their operations, which had caused climate impacts, which were hitting countries like the Philippines much harder um, than, than other places. And, and so this, this was all like very, very real and like visceral for the, the Philippines because in 2013, there had been this terrible typhoon that hit the country, Typhoon Haiyan. It's one of the strongest storms ever recorded in history. And, and scientists said there was definitely, um, it was definitely intensified by, by climate change. And so in, in the course of my trip there, I went to Tacloban City, which was the city that had been um, totally devastated by the typhoon and thousands of people were killed. And I, I met this young woman named Joanna Sustento. And um, 
when the typhoon hit, um, many of her family members drowned and, and she was really unsure how to, how to rebuild her life after that disaster happened. And before then, she hadn't really been too interested in climate change or, or anything to do with the environment. She was just like a normal, like 20 year old thinking about her career. But she started learning more and more about the, the role that climate change had, had played in causing this disaster. And, and then she also started to see some of the same reporting about um, what Exxon knew internally about climate change that I had seen, that Enrique Rosero had seen, that a lot of people had seen. And Joanna was like, she was like fascinated and horrified by this because she's like, what? Like these, these companies knew um, that their products were causing like catastrophic impacts around the world, but they hid this from the public. And, you know, incredibly, like some of these companies like Shell, for instance, had even predicted that climate change would cause stronger and more intense tropical storms like in the 80s and 90s. And, and Joanna was like, you know, in a, in a sense, they knew that this disaster, some version of this disaster would, would, would hit the country. And, you know, um, Sony, my family members are now dead because this information was never made public. And so Joanna now, um, you know, has, has made it kind of her life's mission to hold these, these companies accountable for the, the lies they told. To the public and I, I I just really wanted to include her story in the book to show that this this isn't some just like theoretical or abstract thing that I'm talking about this is like real human lives yeah. that are at stake yeah definitely humanizes the story for sure and it's so important not to forget that aspect of it and you know I want to I'm going to ask you a couple more questions I'm going to turn it over to the chat I'm going to go take a look at all these questions that are building up and definitely um, we'll, we'll put some time into those, but I want to ask you about the gendered and racial components in this story, which you, you know, allude to occasionally in the book. You know, I couldn't help but notice how the, in this history of oil and gas and that history of denial, um, it isn't a very diverse history in terms of the cast of characters, right? You know, um, very male and very, you know, for example, Rex Tillerson, you describe how as CEO of Exxon, he sold gas, diesel, jet fuel all over the world, produced oil and gas in every continent, you know, except Antarctica and how he projected, you know, power and masculinity, right? Like, could you talk about that more and what some of your observations about that are now reflecting on the book and, you know, and actually how the, the, the female characters, um, Joanna Sustento and family, and also Lucy Molina, uh, and indigenous groups such as the indigenous inhabitants in, in uh, Cavallini, uh, how they had to re be reallocated, relocated because of the rising oceans. You know, this, could you reflect on that racial and gender divide there seems to be? And, you know, do you think there could be a shift uh, in the future in this? Um, I mean, I, I, th I think we're already kind of witnessing that shift in, in terms of the people who are like really leading climate movements around the world. Um, I, I think it's become a lot, um, the movements have become a lot more diverse than they were even a few years ago. But I, I, I think like broadly speaking, you know, the oil and gas industry and in particular, Canadian oil has has always aligned itself with some of the most like reactionary conservative forces in society. And so I, I, I think back to the company that started the very first oil sands operation, Sun Oil. They're an American company um, and they are now known as Suncor. People forget that they started in, in the US though. And um, one of the people in, involved in that company was um, Howard Pugh, and he was about as, you know, wealthy and white and, and male as they come and also had, you know, deeply reactionary, libertarian, extremely religious mm -hmm. politics. And so he was a huge critic of FDR's New Deal. He thought it was like communist. Um, and he was, he saw the development of a massive oil industry in Canada that could supply petroleum to the United States as a way to combat the like godless like Soviet communism that he was convinced was taking over the world. And, you know, that's 
that's like you know 50 or 60 years ago but i i i think that i think that still stands like um oil and the power structure that is built up around it um is is meant to support sort of like the basis levels of the status quo which often mean you know um, um a male at the top of the power structure in society and you know interestingly like there there have been a lot of attacks on that um, over the years from increasingly effective climate movements and they're they're often being led now by by people of color and a whole diverse range of of activists but you know i i, I don't want to say it, it's just like you know males with all the power and then these you know marginalized groups you know fighting to reclaim a bit of it like a few weeks ago i did a climate talk in um, Winnipeg and one of the other panelists was this woman Sharon Eubanks. Um, and she was part of the, the federal prosecution team against big tobacco in the United States. And now she's working on um, climate litigation too. She's very interested in it. And, and so this, this is someone who is like extremely powerful, tapped into the, the, the legal structure of, of the United States. And, you know, she's actively working to sort of undo some of this disinformation machinery that's been built over the years. But, but yeah, I mean, when you look at the history of disinformation, who are the people spreading it? Um, a lot of dudes. <laughs> You know, my, yeah, my colleague, uh, Robert Clifford, who's of the Wasanich First Nation, you know, talked about how he doesn't like the word Anthropocene, because it sort of implies that we all caused it when really it was those in power that did, you know, and I just, I thought that was so interesting to think about. Um, have you gotten any pushback or criticism beyond, you know, the usual for writing this book, like for the people named in the book, or, you know, like kind of any pressure put on you? I, have, I haven't really gotten any pushback on it, at, at, at least not yet. Um, no lawsuits? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> um, but what I, what, I have, what I have noticed that, that's been very interesting to me is, is kind of the, the way it's been received in Canada versus the way it's been received in the United States. Mm. And so there've there've been a, a a lot of people in Canada who are extremely interested in this book and i mean that's that's why i'm doing this talk right now and i'm really um grateful for the the platform and the ability to to speak to everyone today um and you know and i i've i've done other like various talks and stuff across the country but you know by by and large like major mainstream media in Canada is is not is not really interested in in doing this story and I I haven't I haven't I haven't felt the same level of interest as I have in the United States which is it's kind of fascinating to me hmm. um you know especially because this is such a Canadian centric book I wasn't even sure if anyone in the U.S. was would care about it but there was there was like a like a big like very positive review in the Washington Post. I've been on major podcasts. Um, I've I've done like hour long interviews on um, on radio stations in in like California and the Midwest. There's there's all these events taking place. We're having like the U.S. launch in in New York soon. And there's there's just been this like level of intensity and interest that I just haven't felt in Canada. And so I, I don't know the reason other than right, here, other than other, right now, <laughs> other than right now. And so I, I think that I think that's that speaks to an extent to like the level of power that this industry still exerts over yeah. the conversations we're allowed to have about yeah. climate change. Um, we're, we're not we're not allowed to to blame the big, powerful companies for lying to us. That isn't considered, you know, polite or objective. And I'm, I'm kind of trying to change that a little bit. You know, and so stemming from that too, what do you hope the impact of your book will have in Canada? Other than, you know, the, the glowing reviews and all that, like in terms of long-term impact, like what kind of impact would you like to see? Would you like to see lawyers read this book and be like, let's sue the pants off these guys 
which would be great. I mean, you've done a lot of the homework for them. I mean, I I would just like to see people read it and and discuss it and, and take it and and add more to it. Um, and and I think it, it goes back to something you were saying at the beginning of this conversation, which is we've we've kind of viewed ourselves in Canada as like a bit separate from all of the chaos that's yeah. taking place in the United States. And and I want people to realize that we were actually like up in Canada, our oil and gas industry was like, you know, played a starring role in creating this like disinformation chaos that we're now witnessing. Um, you know, just to give you one example, the reason that the company Coke Industries is what it is now mm -hmm. is because of a refinery it owns in Minnesota that imports cheap oil from Canada. And it's now one of the biggest tar sands refiners in the United States. And, and this was seen as being absolutely critical to the Coke industry's business empire. And the refinery was multiply, um, was referred to at multiple times by people within the company as the cash cow of, of the entire um, empire. And so that, that fortune allowed Charles and David Coke to set up um, libertarian think tanks, to pay for groups that led climate denial campaigns, to do all of the work of eroding democracy that we've read about in books like Dark Money by Jane Meyer. And Canadian oil was like financing a lot of that. Uh, but that's not a story we ever hear in Canada. And, and I, I just want people to be more aware of that, not, not to feel like guilty or bad necessarily, but just so we know the truth about this emergency that, that we're in and who's responsible for it. Fantastic. All right, I'm gonna turn now more officially, I've been picking off a few questions from the Q&A, but now I'm gonna dedicate some time to these wonderful folks that are listening. Uh, I'll start with the question from Jackie. Mitigating climate change emerged as a topic on political party agendas in the 1990s. What is your interpretation of how climate change became to become so uh, came to become so politicized in the first place, starting in the 1970s. I mean, it, climate change became so politicized because of an intentional effort on behalf of of the oil and gas industry, and you know, and and some other players too. But yeah. oil and gas was was central to that. And, and to just give you one example, in, in 1991, um, a group linked to Coke Industries, they're called the Cato Institute, they held one of the first, the world's first events devoted to climate change denial. And it, they gathered a bunch of people who were not climate scientists who discussed how to undermine public trust in climate change. But what's really revealing about that conference and the brochure that was produced because of that, um, some of the language in that is is pretty is pretty defensive. It's there's there's stuff that says like you may be wondering as a conservative why we're critiquing the science behind climate change. Isn't it common wisdom that it's good to address this and it will be positive for the economy? We're here to say that it isn't. And and what what that kind of reveals to me at the time is the they they knew that this was like a pretty bipartisan like popular yeah. issue that it wasn't super controversial and and there was a deliberate effort to make it controversial mm -hmm. to undermine the science and and to set up as a true litmus test of whether you're cons a conservative or not um if if you also denied that that it was real yeah yeah. So, uh, and, and picking up on that too, Tim has a question, uh, being the similarities in messaging and tactics and misinformation surrounding the impacts of big oil and big tobacco seems to be fairly well documented. And yet the decline in public opinion surrounding tobacco in the global north does not seem to be something that we have seen yet regarding fossil fuel industries. Why would you say this is the case? And also, I'll also pick up Sahar's question too, which is a bit of a bridge, but I'm curious what you think about the current Just Stop Oil campaign in the UK and how disinformation is forming around that campaign. Um, I think we, we haven't seen that decline in public opinion yet around oil and gas because, you know, that, 
that that narrative is is still not in the mainstream Des, despite you know the years and years of of research from investigative journalists and lawsuits it's 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 not it's it's not perceived as as common wisdom yet and and it was only actually this year that there were you know major documentaries out um, on PBS and and a few other networks that were drawing attention to this history and so like to me, it feels like people have been talking about this stuff forever. And in my like climate world, it's it's all yeah. kind of common wisdom. But part of what I realized in doing this, this book was like a, a lot of the public actually just isn't isn't totally aware of this stuff yet. And I, I I don't know what it would take to achieve that kind of like tipping point in public opinion that that happened with the tobacco industry when finally like enough whistleblowers came forward and there were enough documents that mm -hmm. people could see the the lies but you know it's worth remembering with tobacco it took a very long time for that to happen it it, it took decades and decades and and for a long time the narrative around um, cancer and tobacco was very similar to what the narrative now is around climate change and personal responsibility which yeah. is you know, like this, this is your own damn fault for driving Definitely. too much. Um, um, you, you were warned and. And everything causes cancer. You know? Yeah, like, exactly. This has carcinogens in it and this does too. Yeah. Peanut butter does. So, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is, it, it is interesting. A question from an anonymous attendee also related is, do, do you think the penalties for tobacco companies were too light? Should a more punitive position be taken with oil companies? I thought the litigation was pretty impressive in terms of the win, right? It was billions. Am I wrong, Jeff? Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to remember the the exact amount. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to say something incorrect. But it, it was. It was a huge, huge settlement. Of of course, like once once the industry's lawyers got in there, they they whittled it down as much as they could and and got all sorts of car votes. Um, uh. and stuff like that but like you know with with the lawsuits in in the U.S. right now against big oil um, the type of damages cities are asking for are like monumental um, even even just responding to climate change in in like a small number of coastal cities we're we're talking about tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars and you could imagine that if if even one of these lawsuits would was successful, this this could cause an absolute you know avalanche of of litigation that would call into question the existence of this entire industry. And and I I, I think the main thing that people within oil and gas are worried about is is the massive shift in public opinion that would accompany that. Um, so people, they, they know how fast public opinion switches. They measured it very carefully when, when they were trying to sow doubt about climate change and they could see how within a few months or years, um, you know, a majority belief in climate science could be whittled down to like under 40% of people. But public opinion could easily swing in another direction. And suddenly you could have millions and millions of people just absolutely furious at the industry for how much it's lied to them and we're yeah. just beginning to see the very first signs of that happening yeah i mean it is incredibly infuriating just that they sat on that information and how they could have done something just the 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 thinking about those possibilities that could have happened in the same way that they dealt with acid rain you know it just it's it's sort of painful actually now when we have all these tangible realities of climate change just in our face. Um, question from Brian. Can you comment on the capture of our provincial and federal governments by the oil and gas industry? You know, our prime minister's justification for purchasing the TMX pipeline and funding its expansion was that the revenue coming to the government will fund our transition to a clean economy. Right. I mean, can, like Canada's Canada's totally captured by oil and gas, and I I think that's <laughs> it's and and in a way that that U.S. politics aren't. I was and I was talking I was talking to that former federal prosecutor Sharon Eubanks about this, 
And she's like, well, well, yeah. And in the US, it's like, okay, you're a powerful industry, like get in line. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of them all vying for like control and influence. And so like, absolutely oil and gas is incredibly powerful in the US, but it, it, does, it doesn't dominate the politics there as a single issue, the way that oil and gas does in Canada. Um, you know, I've, I've spoken with climate people in Australia who said it's, you know, what, what they witness in Canada is very similar to what they witness in Australia, where the, the coal industry just like um, weighs so heavily on federal climate politics there. And, and so, you know, this, this has impacted our ability to take on the issue in so many different ways. It, it means that, you know, right now there's a huge delegation of oil and gas people um, at the, the climate conference happening right now. Um, it, it means that, you know, politically, we, we haven't been able to have a conversation about these lies that the industry has told and its, its role in, in climate denial. And, you know, contrast that with the US where Congress hauled in the heads of Exxon and other major oil companies and grilled them for hours about their role in spreading disinformation. Like that, it's, yeah. it's unthinkable to imagine something like that happening in Canada. And, you know, a mainstream news outlet will do a very, um, you know, sober, boring story about oil and gas. And then the Alberta government is screaming at them, calling them biased and eco radicals. And so it's just like, right. our entire conversation has just been absolutely hijacked and it's become so normalized that we we don't even realize yeah it's happening and so that that's kind of what I'm trying to push against a bit with this book also yeah the big lie that it's I um so question from anonymous uh do you have links to the city's uh pursuing litigation city of Vancouver did commit some funds uh, a few months ago but the new council is apparently going to cancel that would it be good to be able to forward them uh, some examples. There are some municipalities, right, Jeff, that are suing? In Canada? Or in Can the, I, I recall in, in Victoria States. there was one. Yeah, but I, in the yeah, States you're saying there are a few, right? Yeah, there's like more than 20 jurisdictions. Okay. And, the, and these are like serious lawsuits too. Some of them are led by attorney generals. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. There is a full list of them. Um, I'm just looking it up right now uh, on the, I believe it's the center for climate integrity. Mm. They, they have a list of, of all of the active lawsuits. Um, and, and, you know, like who knows, who knows what will come of, of these efforts, but I was speaking with someone who, who's kind of involved behind the scenes in some of this litigation. And they said it was very interesting this summer to see um, a whole bunch of these lawsuits clear um, um, procedural hurdles and challenges from the oil and gas industry because the judges who had to make those decisions, a lot of them were appointed under the Trump administration. So these, these are conservative, these are highly conservative judges and they, right. they're just considering the evidence and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, there's a case here. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, a great question from Pablo. It takes an immense amount of courage and discipline to uncover these powerful and dangerous individuals and companies for their misdeeds. What advice would you give to the budding journalists and student researchers out there who want to complement the important work you're doing, but may be hesitant to give, may be hesitant given the political nature and risks? Oh, man. Um... <laughs> I, I think the advice that I would give is that you will probably encounter a lot of pushback and criticism, especially in the early days of doing this type of work, but that, that kind of means that you're on the right track. Um, and, and if, like, if your work is like pissing off people in power, um, that's, that's kind of what you want it to do. That's, that's like, I, I think people have forgotten that the role of journalism is to be like 
adversarial to people in power and to ask hard questions and to make people feel uncomfortable um, and, and to get strong reactions from people. Yeah. Um, and and I, I think like, you know, I, I would love if there were just like so many more people doing these types of stories every day um, in the country. And, and so anyone who wants to get involved in this type of work, I, I would say, absolutely um, go for it. And, and, and you really have like the, the, the truth on your side and, and just, just see how much like bullshit is being spread all the time. You know, have you seen the movie Don't Look Up? Yes. Is this it? Is this that movie? <laughs> I mean, are we yes, living? I, don't look up. I, I I think to a large degree, yes. And I'm I'm actually I'm going on the podcast of one of the co-writers of that film next week, David Sirota. Oh, oh um, we got to listen to that. Yeah. So well, I'm I'm sure that will be an interesting conversation. When like when when that film came out, it was kind of interesting because a lot of people in the climate world that I follow were like, yes, yes, finally, someone like telling it like it is. And then a lot of people outside that world being like, this movie is so heavy handed and on the nose and not well, subtle. Yes. And I was like, well, yeah, but it's pretty accurate actually. Uh, question from Michelle. Uh, what role do universities play in educating graduates uh, i.e. In engineers and others about the realities of fossil fuels contribution to climate change? I mean, w one of the roles that universities like UBC can play is just having events like this, I suppose, <laughs> um, and, and kind of having, having those hard conversations. But I, 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 I also think we have to get away from this idea that if if you like, if you call out power, that that's that's like some form of activism or advocacy. Because I I think the role of of journalism is is to expose power and to show how it works and how it perpetuates itself. Um, and you know we're we're at the point now where there will be stories about climate disasters in Canada and the reports won't mention that the majority of climate change continues to be caused by the oil and gas industry in this country. It's, it's, it's sort of like climate change is just this thing that's happening to us. It's not, it's not tied to any specific company or business model. And, you know, it's, it's a completely objective fact that this industry is primarily responsible for the vast majority of warming that we're seeing around the world. And I, I, I don't think it's activisty or anything to just, just state that. It's objective the, the same way that um, reporting on emissions and warming is, is objective. But we, we've just been pulled so far away from that now that it, even if you state this sort of basic truth, then you have people screaming at you and, and saying you're not a real journalist. Yeah. And yeah. so I'd like, I think universities can just push back against that idea by just educating people on, on the truth of why we're, why we're in this emergency. And there's, there's plenty of primary evidence for that. I mean, some of the documents are in my book. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So I don't know if I should squeeze in this last question or if I should Maybe, maybe I'll squeeze in this last question, but you, can, you, can, you have an, a minute to answer it. Uh, from Anonymous, I wonder about the management consulting companies who advise oil and gas industries to continue burning fossil fuels and now port carbon capture to be one of the savior technologies. Aren't they equally culpable in this? Oh yeah, they're, they're, they're culpable. The, the public relations firms that design ad campaigns for oil companies saying that they are like clean energy champions. Those PR firms are culpable. Um, the, the, the people in, in government that, that legitimize this and say things like oil and gas has to be part of the solution. Like it's, 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 not, it's, it's not just 
oil and gas on its its own. It's it's this whole like edifice that exists to to prop up these like blatantly false ideas and to deflect blame from from the industry. Um, media too is is culpable for not educating the public about this. Um, and so I think, you know, this goes back to this question of, you know, what can I do as an individual? I, th I think there, there's so many different areas of, of society that are kind of like propping up one lie or another around climate change. And if, if, if you start to chisel away at those and, and, and take away the broader societal support that some of these companies have to to spread lies then then that that's a way to really sort of start to hold some of these industries accountable and you know ultimately force them to make the changes that we will all benefit from um, because you know the pe the people running these companies they're they're not going to have that much fun on a totally like climate destabilized planet either <laughs> exactly and they also they they live amongst us. They've got grandchildren. You know they've got yeah. there's future generations to also think about. So uh, I, I'm sad to say that I'm out of time in terms of my uh, luxury to get to chat with you. But I will leave with just a few comments um, because this has just been uh, wonderful. Uh, one quote that Dr. Jane Goodall put that just I remind myself of. And it's, it's, she says. We're the most intellectual creature that ever walked on planet Earth. How is it possible that we're destroying our only home? And now at COP27, you know, which is happening right now, the UN Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres, he, you know, he said, we are on the highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator. And the one thing that I appreciated so much in your book is how you know you don't shy away from the realities and you don't try and um, sugarcoat it for us, right? But it's this acknowledgement that we've got a lot of work to do um, and your comment on how joining movements, it's about an exponential impact from this individual, right? And the collective. But what you've done is you've opened our eyes more, given us clarity on the scope of the problem and how to uh, move forward in that regard. Because you know, understanding that, I think, is going to be quite crucial uh, in these next few years when we're operating under this climate emergency. So thank you so much for writing the book, which I think everyone should read, and uh, just putting it all out there for us to absorb and hope act upon. Yeah, hopefully we act upon it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for for this wonderful conversation and, and thanks to UBC as well for inviting me here. I really appreciate it. I also want to add in my appreciation. So thank you both for this really um, incredibly open, inspiring, um, challenging conversation. And to follow up on the role of universities, I'll say that here at the UBC Sustainability Hub, we are committed to ensuring that we have these public conversations as frequently as we can. So thank you again for your time. Uh, it's really uh, just so generous of you. But with, with this level of challenge that we're facing, right, the work that you're doing is, is really uh, an incredible step to us, helping us break this up. So thank you both. Uh, I also want to thank the interpreters who have just done a great job of following along with such as, uh, a conversation like this and helping us make it more accessible. And also to the technical team, to Kate, to, um, to John, and to Tim, who have been helping behind the scenes.